being to order. We have a uh, couple delegations here. I just want to remain, uh, remind the members of council and our delegates that uh, the, this, these proceedings are being telecasted and will uh, be shown on uh, YouTube within the next day or two. So this is will be made public. So on that note, we start with our first delegation. We'd like to welcome uh, Taya Whitehead from Selkirk College. And she's here to speak uh, on uh, the topic of bridging homelessness and health projects. So uh, Taya, the screen is yours. Thanks, Sandy. Um, I, I'm Taya Whitehead. I'm a Dean in the School of Health and Human Services at Selkirk College. And I actually have one of our fourth year um, Bachelor of Science of Nursing students here with me today as well. And so I'm going to let Jordan introduce herself and tell you a little bit about her experience working with the Nursing Street Outreach Program this past year. And then I can quickly share a little bit about our project that we're asking for support for. Awesome. Okay. So thanks for introducing me. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jordan Tristabidoff, and I'm a fourth year nursing student at Selkirk College, and I've had the privilege to work and practice as a street outreach nurse at Selkirk College. So I've worked in Casagar Trail and Nelson, and I was employed by Selkirk College last summer in the same role um, on the Rural Homelessness and COVID-19 project. Uh, during this project, we surveyed individuals on COVID-19 and the impacts it had on much needed services in conjunction to providing outreach services and care to the homeless population. So Selkirk College Street Outreach focuses on health promotion, disease prevention, community capacity building, and operates within a harm reduction lens. Outreach nurses serve clients who lived, live in characterized by instability in housing, extreme poverty, fixed incomes, chronic unemployment, and poor nutrition. And the goal of the survey was to improve the health and resilience of West Kootenai residents experiencing homeless 19, um, sorry, homelessness during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. This experience helped me realize I want to dedicate my career to reducing barriers and improving the health of our most marginalized. Through collaboration and allyship, we together, all of us can make a difference in the lives of those who are marginalized in society. And I believe that providing positions like this can help future nurses to view vulnerable populations in a new light. These important efforts can only work with the support of community and partnerships. And I believe that students in this role become less likely to stigmatize clients with mental health and addiction struggles and are more likely to advocate for them. Ultimately, I believe this work will help create a workforce that treats clients with respect and autonomy um, and I know in trail, uh, there's a lot of fear and pushback from the community when it comes to supporting the vulnerable. Because of this, I really wanna reiterate and enforce that I never felt unsafe or threatened in this program. Um, and that we need to start recognizing these individuals as important members of our community, allies that just don't need our support, but can add qualities to our society with the stories they can tell and the resilience they show on a daily basis. And I have full confidence that as a community, we can support this population and reach out a hand. Thanks guys. Thanks, Jordan. So Selkirk College has, is in the process of applying to the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council um, to their Community College Social Innovation Project Fund. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, and essentially the project fund is $120,000 a year for three years. And part of the proposal is requirement is letters of support. So what we're asking for is a letter of support from the, the city of Trail. Um, and in that letter of support, we kind of have two um, requests. The first is a request for in-kind support for the duration of the three years of the project. And that would be $2,500 a year for three years of in-kind support. So that would be, uh, it was calculated at $500 a day and five days a year. So things like participating in a summit or any of those kind of pro special projects that come up. This is really, this project's really being built on um, the project that, that Jordan worked on over the summer, the Rural Homelessness and COVID-19 and in partnership with the street nursing outreach program. So ideally we would have um, street nursing outreach students or summer interns that would be uh, in the communities of Castlegar Trail and Nelson 
for, through the full calendar year. So right now there's breaks in service of when those students are, are out on the street. And this would allow us to bridge sort of some of those time periods. So the second part of their request is funding of $7,500 to match a my tax uh, fund that's available to leverage uh, um, student internships for the summer. So if the city of trail were to fund us with $7,500 my tax would match that and then we would be able to hire a student like Jordan like we did this last summer to be involved in the research that we would be conducting. And there's more details in the project proposal overview that was sent to you specifically to the outcomes of the project. So if you have any questions, Jordan, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you, Taya. Any questions from council? I have a question, Councillor Santori. Uh, go ahead, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, Jordan and Taya, first, I just wanna really commend you with the student outreach program through our community task force, as well as uh, through our social housing committee. I get quite a bit of feedback from Interior Health on the work that the student nurses do, the outreach, and I really wanna commend you for the excellent work you do uh, to support our most vulnerable population. And I realize with healthcare, we're just, everyone is just so, um, stretched right now and the student nurses really provide a very valuable, uh, they're one really important piece in the whole cog that is helping us and manage and assist the vulnerable population. Um, that said, I had a couple questions um, and I think you might have uh, answered one. So the in-kind as well as the cash donation of $7,500, you are asking for a three-year commitment Thank you, Mayor. Um, the first, the in-kind is $2,500 a year for three years for a total of $7,500. And the cash commitment, we're actually just asking for this one year um, right now. So $7,500 for um, the, it would be summer of 2021. <laughs> okay. Um, and then my second question is, have you had replies from Nelson and Castlegar as yet? And what is the impact to your organization if one or two or three don't end up funding? So we haven't had a reply from Nelson yet because the timeline for this project was really tight. We have actually, their meeting next Monday. So um, the, the letters of support are the important part for us to get in for the immediate proposal, which um, we have to have in by the end of this week. Uh, the funding support, the direct funding support um, is, is a secondary piece. So it would only really matter if we were funded for the project. So we're putting in the proposal for the project right now. The my tax funding comes along if we're successful in, in this project. So the city of Castlegar has asked us to consider applying to the CBT Community Initiatives Fund for that $7,500 and we haven't heard from the city of Nelson yet. Okay. Anything no. else, Lisa? Any other members of council? I have a question, Sander. Go ahead, um, Carol. Teo, when you had the summer student last summer working, where did the funding come from in order to, uh, to pay her? So we actually were successful in receiving um, a proposal through the National Science Engineering Research Council last year. It was a, a shorter proposal with a focus on COVID-19 and homelessness. So the funding for that proposal project came from a similar pot of money um, that we're applying to this time as well. Okay, thank you. I have a question, Sandy, Eleanor. Go ahead, Eleanor. Uh, Tanya, uh, why aren't you asking the other municipalities to uh, jump on the bandwagon here? We've certainly considered um, reaching out to the regional districts as well. So we are asking the three um, cities of Castlegar, Nelson and Trail. And that's primarily where our focus has been for the outreach programs at this point in time. Um, but we have considered reaching out to the other um, regional districts as well, specifically for the my tax funding component. The, one, of the, one of the questions that came up with our team was whether or not we should apply to the CBT community initiatives, for example, for um, RDCK areas I and J. The question that comes up is often they want to know the, the demographic of people who 
would normally reside in their region, but the homeless populations that we're working with are primarily centralized in the three city boundaries. Okay, thank you. If I may, Robert. Robert oh, go ahead, Robert. Robert Sandy. Well, you know that the city of Trail really only represents uh, 7,700 out of 22,000 one third about uh, about one third of the population of the area. And I think probably a number of, uh, of these people actually come from outside of the city, although they may be in the city and you're working with them in the city, but they probably come out from outside. So I would encourage you to, to, um, to approach all those groups. I wouldn't do it through the regional district because there's not a function in that regional district that could support that. But you could, you could approach all the individual municipalities plus the two electoral areas because that's where the people come from. I mean, uh, at the best, one third come from trail. Thank, Thank you, I'll take, I'll take that back to our team. Any other, um, mm -hmm. if I may, any other comments from any members of council? If not, I just have a couple no, more questions. Screen is freezing, by the way, Sandy. You're, sorry, Sandy, sorry, yeah. the screen is freezing for some reason, and some of the pictures up on top have disappeared. So I don't know what it is. Oh, mine are still there. Just me not here. Sure. Are they totally gone? Okay, thank you. Oh, are yours totally gone, Robert? Well, the pictures are gone up on top. Yeah, and the pictures on top. I only got four of, of the whole bunch, yeah. But Try that's to... okay. I can function. Okay. Um, sorry, Tia. That's okay, Sandy. I can function. Okay. Um, I just want a, a couple questions and a comment. Uh, and I totally agree with what Robert and, and Eleanor said in terms of reaching out to other communities. And, and while I totally understand that they're centralized within the bigger centers and you know, looking at their demographics, I think they, they have to be a little bit more open-minded. First of all, I think you'll agree that homelessness and, and health amongst our most vulnerable is an issue whether you live within those cities or not. You could have a granddaughter or a child that lives in Thrums or Glade or whatever and reside in Trail and you would hope that they're gonna get the help that you're trying to provide. So. Um, I don't think we can, you know, when you're talking to your team, I think it's more than whether or not they have the problem in their community. It's going to impact them, affect them, or help them in some way if this program is to is to move forward. So uh, I would urge you, as other councillors have, to, you know, um, and it's not even so much the money issue, but I think they have to be part of helping us with the solution to these issues as well. Uh, it's just as much a problem for them. We see it every day, but it impacts them as well. The second question is, what do you expect to get out of this research? And I'm not questioning the research that you're doing, but what do you expect to get out of this research that the Ministry of Health or Ministry of Social Services uh, has not done um, on a provincial level? What do you see different? Thanks, Councillor Santori. Um, what we're really hoping to get out of this research, there's there's three different objectives, but one of the key objectives is really to, um, much like you've suggested in your um, suggestion to reach out to the other municipalities, is to promote collaboration between the organizations and the communities and share lessons learned, try to avoid duplication of services, um, and make best use of what limited resources we have in our West Kootenai region. And so um, I think that a lot of the, of the project is really looking at our local demographic in the West Kootenays versus the, the broader provincial um, research that often happens in more urban settings. Part of the, of the funding proposal was uh, literature review. And as I was working through some of the research, there's actually very little research on rural homelessness in comparison to homelessness that's specific, um, research that's specific to larger urban areas. We have the advantage of the street nursing program already being on the ground in those communities. So it facilitates our ability to conduct research with the participants as well as to mobilize the, the local organizations in a really meaningful united way across communities. Okay, and I have one more question um, or more of a comment than it is a question and it's not intended to discourage you in going forward with what you're trying to achieve but 
uh, without having done the research, I think you'll agree that there will be some initiatives that are going to come out of this that are going to require provincial funding or federal funding, funding to levels that municipalities uh, well, we're never intended to to fund social functions and like we totally support the nursing program and what they're doing on the street. But at the end of the day, issues like poverty and housing and, and um, you know, the, the reduction of middle class in terms of people's affordability, all of those things that contribute and result in some of unfortunately putting people in vulnerable positions, drug addiction and mental illness. Uh, at the end of the day, I'd hate to see a report come out with these recommendations and then the province not being able to follow through on the findings that may be different than uh, what they're experiencing, experiencing in, um, in urban areas. Far too often, smaller communities, and many of us have been on council for a long time, we see these reports and we see these studies, we get the answers, and unfortunately, we don't see the outcome, any outcomes from these reports because the higher levels of government for reasons probably of financial or other priorities don't follow through. So I'm not meant to, it's not meant to discourage you, but I think you should be aware up front that many municipalities will not have the type of financial resources that may be needed, whether it be for housing or um, mental, uh, mental, and, um, mental health and addiction services personnel to deal with those issues. So I'm sure you're going in with that already, that knowledge already there. So it's just a heads up because far too often people get discouraged after the research is done and then it sits on a shelf and waiting for upper levels of government to act on it. Sorry for being so long winded. <laughs> That's okay. I appreciate the feedback. And certainly we are aware of, of some of the boundaries and limitations that we're facing. And part of the benefit of a three-year project is, is a bit more time to work through some of that stuff. Awesome. Thanks, Tia. Are there any other questions of council? And, and Tia, this will be discussed uh, later on in the meeting when we get to the to the grants. So if council you want- Senator, sorry, I'll just, Can I just make a quick comment? Yeah, go ahead, Tia. Yeah, or, Tia yeah. and Jordan, I just, I just really want to thank you again for your work. Um, you know, I, I see great value in the nursing program, street nursing program continuing, and I really hope you do get the three-year funding for the grant. I think it's really important. Um, I think there's always going to be a funding shortfall and always a need, but I think any information we can get on our, our local population, which separates us and gives us power, right, gives us power through knowledge to try to get some funding at a provincial level is really, really important. So again, just thanks for your work and, and commitment. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Taya. And like I said, you're more than welcome to stay on. Um, and take part of this. We will be making a decision or dealing with it later, but we do understand if you want to leave in a decision, uh, we'll get back to you as quickly as possible from staff. Thank you, I appreciate it. And we probably will sign out um, and continue working on writing out the rest of our proposal that's due at the end of the week. But Good thank answer. you very much, um, Mayor and Council, and I really appreciate you giving us the time today to present our project idea. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. Bye. Keep up the good work. Okay, our second delegation today is from Trail Youth Baseball and we have uh, Keith DeWitt, I believe Jimmy Maniego and Wayne Florco regarding uh, uh, Butler Park. And uh, before, um, I don't, I'm not sure who's speaking on behalf of Trail Youth Baseball. I just wanna inform them that uh, with respect to the report that you've seen in the open agenda, uh, it's not council's intention or we will not be making any decisions in terms of any of the options. A few things have transpired uh, over the last few days and their staff currently working on some other options for council to consider. So we will not be making any decision, but we welcome your comments and your concerns uh, that you have towards uh, the dilemma that we're faced with and that's the removal of the, of the light standards. Unfortunately, uh, our purpose today is mainly to, well, number one is to hear your concerns, but number two is to make official or make a decision on the removal of the damaged uh, or deteriorating lamppost as they do create a significant liability for the city currently. And we don't want a chance uh, 
them falling over onto the highway or onto an individual or a vehicle. So that is paramount today, uh, but we will expedite the decision-making process once we have all of the information in front of us so that we can make an informed decision going forward. So uh, on that note, I would welcome either Keith, Wayne, or Jim, or whoever you've delegated uh, to speak, or you can each speak, uh, and we're here to listen. Okay, thanks, Councillor Santori. Um, I'll probably start speaking, and um, I think I know most of you, but I have Jim Maniago. I'm the president of the Trail Youth Baseball, and uh, also Councillor Santori's favorite referee. Um, <laughs> so, well, that again just, would be a conflict of interest, Jim. <laughs> um, I just want to give you a bit of my background. I've, since I got back from university, I've run the, the senior men's Orioles team and that's going on 27 years. I've been on the executive of Little League um, and Trail Youth Baseball. I've coached, I've played, I've umpired. And I think it, I'm comfortable saying, I don't think anyone knows Butler Park better than me. Um, I did some, just some round numbers thinking about it. And I've probably been involved in over 2000 practices and games over those 25 years, 27 years. And I really think that you know, we should be able to work together on this and the, the risks that we're talking about, I don't know if they're as big as what we might have been initially thinking. Um, I've never seen a ball hit a car on Columbia Avenue in 27 years. Um, we have seen a couple of house windows broken, but, you know, I can count them on one hand. And, you know, parked cars, yeah, that, that happens. But I can tell you that every baseball park that I pull up to, the first thing you do is you look at where's home plate, where a ball's going to fly out of here and where do I park? So I don't think that this is a unique situation to Butler Park. There's houses around parks. There's roads around parks. Um, Grand Forks, Nelson, Kelowna is right downtown Kelowna. So I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel here. And, you know, I know there's a suggestion about putting up 90 foot netting around. That honestly is unheard of. I, if you find another park anywhere in, in North America that has 90 foot um, netting all the way around that I'd, I'd be surprised um, <coughs> you know and I know Keith Keith sent a really good email outlining what you know some of the research shows in terms of foul balls and, and what might happen and I think just to to further that you know those are with adults and and older kids half the kids 60 percent of our games are with our younger group um, our junior group we call them and quite honestly, they, they wouldn't be able to hit the ball that, as far as the houses. I could stand my daughter there who would be at Butler Park this year if she played and tell her to hit it as far as she can and she wouldn't be able to hit a house. So I think really we're just talking about our high school kids um, with no lights now, we're only looking at, you know, maybe two or three games a week. And with Keith's numbers, we're talking about a handful of balls that may or may not leave the park and hit something. And so I really think that you know, we can get a point of, of lowering the risk that we're worried about. Um, in, in terms of trail youth baseball, our numbers are growing. Our executive, we've got a great group. When we were in Little League, when my son started Little League, when he was seven, there were 77 kids. When he, he left, when, there was, when he was 12, there was 166. Then we came down to Butler Park, there was 35 kids registered. Um, this year, we were hoping to, to get up, up to 100. Um, Again, a lot of it depends on COVID, of course, and some of the damage done from last year. But, you know, our executive has done a really good year of a really good job of, of increasing our membership. And I think it is important that these kids have a place to play. Um, we've got eight to 10 kids that are looking at college scholarships in the next two years. Um, I'm on the horn with, with college coaches. I was on the weekend again. Um, and these are not like the Smokies where it's not a kid from Arizona. It's not a kid from Vancouver. These are local kids. Um, so I just, I can't emphasize enough how important it is that we need to kind of keep the momentum going and, and build on what we've done the last few years. Our team won a state championship in Washington two years ago, the first Canadian team ever to do that. Um, you know, we just applied and were accepted into the highest level of league in BC minor baseball, the college prep league. Um, we were told that it would never happen. They wouldn't expand the trail, but I was able to pull a few strings, got us in. And, you know, part of the reason we got in is because of the facility we have. Butler Park is known as a nice park. Um, 
And, you know, if, if we don't have a place to play, if we pull out of that league, we'll never get in. We'll never get in again, and our kids will have nowhere to play. So the impact we're talking about is huge. Um, we came in initially, we were going to fight about the lights um, because playing without lights it really does hurt our program. We, we won't be able to run um, the normal program that we do. But I think for a year or two in the short term, we can limp through that um, and, and get around it. We won't be able to host any tournaments. A provincial championship is off the table unless you have lights. Um, but I think we can get through a couple of years while we build back to that. But having no park, um, it truly would kill the program. We, you know, we couldn't do much last year because of COVID and you know, two or three years without baseball and we would lose our executive and the kids will find other things um, and, and we just, we won't be able to, to function. So, I mean, I just got a couple of more comments just to end and, and you know, I've carried the trail flag with the Orioles um, all around BC to Calgary, to Winnipeg, to Saskatoon. We were fortunate enough to go to the nationals in Halifax. Um, I've always been proud of trail and the facilities that we've got. I've always bragged about our partnership that we've got with city council. Um, you know, last summer I had a coach saying, how do you do it? You've got a city of 8,000 people. How are you competing with the lower mainland teams and, and Kelowna and these big centers? And I, I've always said that, you know, we pride ourselves in trail and our sports and our facilities and council has always been with us. Um, Wayne and I applied for the nationals for, for the Orioles a couple years back. And Wayne was making his presentation in Vancouver. He had Mayor Boggs on the phone saying that, you know, the council and city would do whatever it took. Um, and mm -hmm. we didn't get it because we didn't have a second facility to support it. That's why we didn't get the nationals. So if we don't even have one, you know, it really it changes the whole landscape. So just to close, I think we've got two options today. You know, the easy way is to shut the park. And unfortunately, I think youth baseball will die. Um, or we can do the right thing and that's work together as a partnership, keep the park open in the short term, keep us going. We're happy to apply for grants and, and rebuild this thing back up in phases. So that's all I've got to say today. Um, I don't know if Keith or Wayne has anything to add or if you've got questions for me. I would certainly like to mention a couple of things that uh, Jimmy dwelt on. And uh, the very first thing is when you uh, talk about trail, why do people live here is because of the lifestyle and sports. And uh, I've been involved in baseball since 1987, where uh, prior to that, Jim Maniego was in Little League and I coached him. And uh, our mayor's mom was on the executive where I was there. And Carol Doby's son was on one of the teams I played on and uh, or I coached on. So, you know, a, a long history. But the unique thing about baseball in this town is it's a little different from hockey and soccer is that we've, through all those years, have had an active working relationship with the city. Uh, like Jimmy talked about, we've put on tournaments here and I've seen many of you people at those tournaments. And uh, I looked at our facilities and I looked at the netting and um, we wanna work with you people. But you know, one of the suggestions to keep the park going, at least for this year's, uh, as if I look back to last year and uh, the success we had and uh, Jimmy putting in all that time, there, there wasn't a concern. There wasn't a liability concern with the nets the way they were. Why can't we start with that and work to your standards and work together so that we do have, uh, we work uh, in terms of uh, providing, working with some funding, but also uh, volunteer help and labor if it's taking when the poles are down, if it's clean up, whatever, which we've done in the past and we've maintained that field for years and years, right? we're willing to do that. But it's very important to have these kids uh, uh, playing ball. You know, my two boys played ball in town and when they both graduated from the program here, five of each, uh, five members from each of their teams went on scholarships. Local kids went on scholarships. Mm -hmm. And we have the opportunity to, to, do, to do that for these kids today. And I think we need to do that. We need to support these kids and help them out. And 
that's our job. We, we're, we're here. I'm, I've got nothing to gain other than uh, I've, I really appreciate what my family had uh, been involved in the program and what my kids benefited. And I'd like to see others do that. If I may, Wayne, just first of all, let me uh, thank you and Jim and you guys for coming uh, to make your presentation. And um, I, I, I want to be clear that, you know, the last thing that council wants to do, and I, I'm, I think I'm speaking on behalf of all council, you know, it's not like we woke up in the morning and say, and said to each other, you know, how can we screw up minor baseball and trail? We've been faced with a dilemma. Uh, I'll be very honest. I think the options that were provided um, were done with the best intent. However, it's back to the drawing board. And I think council wants to, in each as much as, sorry, council wants to as much as possible ensure that you guys have a baseball season this year. And that's why I started off the meeting saying, we're not going to be making a decision today as a result of the dialogue that's taken place over the last week. Staff has been redirected to look at some other doable options. Many of these are not doable for a number of reasons, finances being one of them. So uh, it's not uh, in my, I don't think it's council position, it's this or nothing with these four options. They are back at the table. And uh, I can assure you, we will be calling back on you uh, regardless of what option we take, but if it is to, when it is, I should say, to keep the ballpark open, we would need your services probably, and we appreciate that offer. Uh, like I said, nobody wants to be in this position, and I think we can avoid looking at any of those four options, which when you look at it on the surface, I think it took Jimmy 10 seconds from when he read it to send me an, a text message or a message saying, what the hell are you doing? So, a lot has transpired in the last four or five days. Um, we get it. I think all of council gets it, but I'll let them speak up for themselves if they want. We want to make this work and we'll make every effort to, to make it work. Uh, again, without making promises at this point, because it's not the purpose of this meeting to make decisions, but if we can make it happen, we'll make it happen. Any other comments from council or your worship? Do you have any comments? Well, no, I got Robert, you know, yeah, exactly what Sandy said, you know, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that uh, the, uh, the park can remain open and, uh, and hopefully uh, the uh, items that we're talking about, both the netting and the lighting will come in due time if you can make it for a year and, but I really encourage you to approach, um, you know, Columbia Basin Trust because uh, I know that they've got a, a tremendous number amount of finances this year specifically and and, uh, and if you do need, um, you know, uh, because we have a representative there, Murray McConaughey, you know, and if you, if you need uh, to talk to anybody, you can talk to Murray because Murray is only, he's one of five uh, directors there at the Columbia Basin Trust. And uh, they have supported a number of uh, recreation facilities over the last year and a half or two years. And that's because they have the extra money. So that's something you should be looking at really carefully. And I'm sure council would support you if in fact you made those applications to, to Columbia Basin Trust. Thank you though for coming out today, I appreciate it. Eleanor and Sandy. Go ahead, Eleanor. Uh, thank you both Jimmy and Wayne and Keith for all your help regarding Trail Youth Baseball and the other organizations that you uh, so proudly support. I, I echo what what Sandy and Robert have said. And another area you could go is to the community initiative uh, grants too. There's another area that uh, you could, you, you know, get your fingers in, but keep up the good work and we are there with you. Thank you. And the other Thank thing, you. if we proceed and lights become something in the, and lights are in the plans down the road, whether it be a year, two years, there's also grants that come out from provincial and federal government dealing with infrastructure and recreation. It's not just trail youth baseball applying for grants for, uh, you know, rebuilding a ballpark lights. I think that'll probably fall more on, on city and provincial and federal programs. And if, you know, by watching the news and listening to the prime minister and the premier and trying to rebuild our economy, I think it would be safe to say, and if David's on, he can vouch for it. Usually when we go through tough times like this to stimulate economies, grants come forward from provincial governments and federal governments mm -hmm. to kind of put some, uh, 
get the wheels turning and getting people to work and seeing things happen. So I'd be shocked if there was not some programs coming from both provincial and federal governments, as well as Columbia Basin Trust to stimulate the economy once we get over this, uh, this COVID. So uh, I think, you know, there's a good chance that those will be made available. So if we could find a fix in the short term, buy us some time and to be able to apply or at least research and apply for grants to give us a better understanding of our costs, then we'll move to that next step. But just so you know, our first priority now is to meet your goals and objectives. And that's to, you know, to carry out the good work that you guys have done and got us into a premier league for this year, which is, which is great news. I'm getting goosebumps thinking of the 1995 World Series uh, right now. So again, you know, have some confidence in your council that uh, we want to make this work for you and we'll make every ditch effort to uh, to see that that goes that that happens so unless there's any other comments from any or questions mayor Pazin. yeah um councillor doby do you want to go first and then i'll just finish off no, i didn't i don't I, see carol I, on my screen sorry carol that's okay i just have one quick comment i mean we know trail is the home of champions and probably baseball and hockey are the two most highlighted sports that have brought us to that position but you know what, being a homo champions just isn't about the athletic ability of these uh, athletic participants. It's about the people that have supported them and worked with them for years that has brought them to that level. And so I hope you all consider yourself as part of the homo champions. And I wanna say really thank you for your dedication. And um, I do remember working with some of you when we were in Little League. And I just have one quick comment about Mayor Paisen's mother at <laughs> that point time when we were working in the uh, Bob's kitchen and we were supporting the kids when they were playing their games, you were short a coach and uh, Mayor Pays's mother stood up and said, you know what, I can chew gum and spit at the same time. So I think I can coach a team if you really need me. So thank you very much for coming today. Thanks, Carol. So did you have anything to add Keith or, uh, or Wayne or um, Jimmy? Um, I, I think they've uh, they've said everything, and I said enough in my email. Uh, you know, about thirty five pages. So uh, I appreciate ran out of battery time uh, reading it, uh, listening to our concerns, and uh, just to kind of reiterate what they said. I mean, uh, you know, the challenges in a small town where we're always dealing from a smaller pool of volunteers, small pool of umpires, coaches, kids. So you know, we've been trying to rebuild this program and get it to the point where you've got a lot of numbers and taking a year off from COVID is going to be a big step backwards, but taking one or two or three years off of playing, it, it sets you back to the point where you don't have the coaches anymore. You don't have enough kids to play, to make a team, put a team together. You don't have the umps anymore. So that's why I think we're, we're it's a little more critical to try to keep the ball rolling rather than take another step back because our numbers are razor thin for teams, umpires, coaches, volunteers. It's you lose one or two and all of a sudden you're scrambling. So it's uh, that's, that's why the urgency is there. And just one, and lastly, I think, I mean, as you know, I mean, we're, we, we take it, there's a lot of pride in it and um, we take a lot of pride in, in the facilities and we take ownership in it. And I think that's why we feel sometimes, you know, like the, the urgency to, to jump in is because yeah we you know we it's we're, our our relationships probably kind of unique with baseball where we're we're maintaining things daily and and getting it ready and and keeping it safe and stuff like that which might be a little bit different than a hockey rink or something like that so you know we if we feel like it's ours sometimes and we know it's not but it it's uh, that's that's why we you know we we do take that ownership and we uh, we have a lot of pride in the facilities and we just want to see them move forward. So I think, you know, a Band-Aid situation this year would be some sort of situation to kind of keep it going would be great. And we're going to be the ones that are right there with you. You know, I've already talked to CBT and, you know, like stuff like that. I think uh, I'm confident that we could, we could, you know, do the improvements over the years together for sure. It's this season just trying to Band-Aid it together so we don't lose this league lose the players, lose the, you know, and have to start from scratch. Thank you very much. Thanks, Keith. Uh, so Do you want me to just say a few words? Sure. 
Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I, um, I'll just say thank you for your approach with this today. I know this is a really passionate issue for a lot of people and there's been a lot of emails and conversations and I, I wasn't quite sure how this was going to go today. So I, you know, I, I really appreciate your methodical, thoughtful and collaborative approach. This is a, it's a complex issue. You know, it's an issue that we knew was eventually coming, but unfortunately the windstorm has accentuated um, something and it's, and it's a lot of money, right? And it's, and it's, there's, con we have to consider liability and risk and, and the sport itself and volunteers and kids. And it's, it's just a very complex issue. So this is the first conversation of many. Uh, it's obvious through all the emails and conversations that we really need to do our due diligence to um, make sure that we have all the information before we move towards long-term solutions. And I think I can just say on behalf of council and city staff that that is what we are committed to, making thoughtful, meaningful decisions and also collaborating with you as um, an important organizing group of Orioles baseball and youth baseball so that we can move forward and try to do, I guess, if I can say a best, best fit projects to fit the need of the sport and how that is changing. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. I just had one quick question that I forgot to ask earlier. Is uh, senior men's ball out of the question for this season or is that still up in the air? Probably out of the, out of, for this season, just okay. with the COVID and stuff. Okay. I mean, that makes it, could make it easier for council when we know it's 15, 16 year olds and that are playing as opposed to guys that used to hit long balls, not you, Wayne, but other people. I can't <laughs> see it, no. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, guys. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. You're welcome to stay for the whole meeting if you have nothing better to do today. <laughs> okay, next is a request from the Trail Curling Association, and that's regarding their lease payment. Mm, no. Sorry, Harris, not, sorry, would you like to talk then about the um, Butler? Oh, sorry, Park? Right. sorry. Go ahead, David. Um, well, I think there, as you've indicated, there's been a lot of sort of um, back and forth over the weekend here as staff are looking at other options with respect to um, the, I guess, the netting issue, <clears throat> the lighting and pole issue. And, you know, we have Tricia and uh, Chris here who also can lend a voice to whatever I'm saying. I might, what I say, I hope is correct. But I think most urgently right now, as I've talked to you earlier today and indicated in emails, is to get pre-budget approval of up to $125,000 to immediately remove um, the current liability that exists there. And with that, I think the sooner we can get on that, um, potentially the easier it would be to sort of make sure that the parks refurbished and it's encouraging to hear that um, the volunteers would be willing to lend a hand depending on um, the level of damage that might occur to the uh, playing surface as the machinery moves around and, and takes these posts down but they definitely are at a point now where they have to come down and that is included within your capital budget that you'll receive next time but if we do get a, a couple week weeks of lead time here um, Chris and his team and with Trisha can get on that aspect of the project right away. Then further to that, there also is definitely a need to, to assess the options as far as the liability is concerned and, and netting uh, may or may not be an option for 2021. Um, there are some significant dollars associated with that. Um, so that has to be explored further. But at least at this juncture, if council will sort of indulge staff and provide that pre-budget approval of the 125,000, then that gives us a green light to start working towards um, getting the posts down. And as I indicated in my email, we're looking for uh, council's authorization also to vary from the purchasing policy. So we don't have to develop a detailed spec and go out to quote, but basically hire a contractor, I would assume, and Chris can speak to it on sort of a time and materials basis as far as um, getting those posts down. But we, we once we've done that, then we know we can sort of um, reassess where we're at as far as achieving the goal of keeping the park open for 2021. And again, I defer to uh, Tricia and Chris if they have any other uh, comments they'd like to make at this time. Chris, Trish, anything? Um, no, I think David captured um, everything I would say to that effect. I think um, 
and again, Chris could chime in uh, more than I could, but I think the idea was to get the poles removed while the ground was frozen to minimize the damage to the actual park surface. So that was a um, kind of through to David's comment about seeking pre-budget approval. I know that was a, an, an idea to help um, not have to do too much turf remediation as well. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Um, it'd be best if we could remove the poles while the ground is frozen. Plus, we would be delayed by weeks, um, possibly a month and a half, if we had to develop a formal contract and specifications and go to tender, evaluate the, the bids. So hence the request to deviate from the purchasing policy. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa? So I'm willing at this point, I'd like to make a motion as described by uh, CAO Perhudoff that we provide pre-budget approval for the amount specified and also to waive the purchasing policy so we can move um, in an expedited fashion to remove the polls. Do we have a seconder? I'll, I'll second. second. Oh, you go ahead, that's fine. Yeah. Can I ask a question? No, who seconded? Sorry, Eleanor. Sorry, I did. Colleen? Okay, go ahead, uh, can't, Eleanor. Can't see me? There you David are. Or, or Chris or somebody who who grows up. Huh? Who is the company? Who is the contractor that you're proposing? You, you, did you hear me? I, I heard a portion of it. I think you are asking who we have in mind for a contractor. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we've been in touch with a crane contractor. Um, to have some preliminary discussion. Plus, we've been in contact with a local area contractor for construction management services, but we would have another discussion with a local area contractor to see if they could manage the project. So kind of up in the air, who would we, who would we use? But we did receive some preliminary budgetary numbers from a local area contractor. That's great. Great, thanks, Chris. Colleen? Um, so we made the motion to uh, change the budget. Do we need to make a motion to um, change the bylaw in bylaw. order to uh, get the contractor? No, we just, okay. No, the money's already in the capital plan that hasn't been presented to us yet. Right. Yeah, yeah, understand that. Okay. I'm so just wondering we, about the bylaw, if we have to change that at all. No, we haven't passed the budget bylaw yet for capital. Okay. I think Councillor Jones might be referring to the purchasing policy. So yes, within, thank the, you. Con oh, within the context of the um, of the motion, it would just right. provide authority to waive policy. So like Chris says, we can expedite as opposed to going through a two month protracted process, which would then disadvantage the whole objective of trying to get this field ready to go for the baseball season. Thank Sorry, you, Colleen, I thought you were talking about the budget. Bylaw. I know I said bylaw, I meant the policy. So if we yeah. have to make a motion to change the, to do the policy, I'll make it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Dave, uh, Robert? It just uh, looking at the long range forecast, I know you're going to get a little bit of cold weather now, but within three weeks, it appears that it's going to be fairly warm. So whatever you can do, if you want to do it when the ground is frozen, you should perhaps move as quickly as possible. That's why it's before us. So if we call question yeah, on the motion, they can get right on it. <laughs> yeah, let's go question on the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> mm -hmm. Carried. If I just may add one thing per Chris and Trish, uh, without getting into detail with council, I gave something to David today, Chris. Uh, if you, What I did, just I just wanted council, I took it upon myself to go down to, to one of our local steel fabricators to see if they would have material to possibly do uh, a Band-Aid solution in the short term, as opposed to some of the options that Kyle has provided us subsequent to the other proposals. If you could just investigate that with Redwood, it may or may not be, I mean, the price looked decent. I don't know if Dave has shared it with you yet, uh, uh, Chris, but it might be worth a, a visit and just to see in a, a conversation with Redwood to see if we, if it comes down to a Band-Aid fix, if we can pull it off now that it's back on the drawing board. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Santori? Yes. Um, uh, CAO Perhudoff, would, would you like 
myself to pass a motion at this time to defer um, or to refer to staff uh, to investigate this issue further with respect to pricing and options and to bring that back to council in, in um, when considering the 2021 budget. Uh, through to Mayor Pazin, yeah, I think that would be appropriate just to refer to staff and I have shared um, the, the little estimate that uh, Councillor Santori um, had had received. Um, there are some shortcomings with it that we've already identified with respect to just the, the, the basis of the posts and what's required to make sure that they're stabilized. But again, it it's going to require some more investigation, not only in the context of what sort of infrastructure can be installed, but also dealing more with the liability. I think as Mr. Maniego indicated, there are a lot of parks that do um, enjoy play without uh, full netting. So yeah. council may have to consider that option with respect to the liability. And we have confirmed with our insurance uh, company that even without netting, we would be covered. So that provides us some safeguards there. So we understand the objective is to um, make the park playable for this year, deal with the immediate liability. So Mayor Pazin, again, if you would make that motion to refer back to staff, we'll do our best to get another report in front of you as quickly as we can with all the various options. And hopefully it'll be something there that's feasible and we can um, make it work so it addresses the needs of the user group. Okay, and so I'll, I'll officially make that motion. Okay, so Mayor Pazin makes a motion to defer I'll second it. and seconded by Eleanor. Any other comments or discussion? No. Okay, not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Sandy. Yeah, go ahead, Robert. I guess uh, I was talking to Jimmy there because he's my neighbor and he was talking about the fact that they really wanted to be able to practice in the field house. And I know, I understand they can't practice in the field house. So can we get maybe just staff to, to give us a reason why that is and whether or not if it's possible to have them practice in the field house because they're willing to pay the, the fees to rent it. Um, well, I'm not aware. David, I don't know, David. Maybe David could comment or, or Trish could comment on it. Trisha, are you there? I am, sorry, just waiting to see if David was gonna chime in, didn't wanna step on his toes. Yeah. The, um, so the field house is the last remaining facility to not technically be opened by the city for use due to COVID-19 protocols. It's an right. unmanned facility and the logistics around managing a space that doesn't have any staff in it was a bit more problematic. Um, further to that, we haven't had the demand for that facility to warrant the justification of expending staff time to go and open that building. So it has not been a priority to date. Uh, I think recognizing baseball's interest in getting rolling, um, they will only be interested in the field house while there's snow on the ground and then they will almost immediately want to be yeah. outside, which like you said, if the weather warms up, my guess is um, there won't be a lot of interest in the field house, uh, even if it was an option for them. And pickleball's closed as well in the gymnasium, isn't it? Correct, because no one over the age of 22 can do um, sporting activities right now. So, and mm -hmm. almost all of our pickleballers um, would qualify to be over the age of 22. Yeah. Probably over the age of 82. Yeah. I wasn't <laughs> gonna go there. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Tricia. Thanks, uh, Chris. Thanks, Chris and, and David. <clears throat> okay. Now we'll move to item 2.2 and that's a request from the Trail Curling Association for lease payment forgiveness. Uh, they've been forced to cancel their season due to yeah. provincial regulations. Uh, what are council's wishes on this? I'll move approval. Yeah. Do we have a second there? I will. Okay, second. There's not really much for discussion as far as I'm concerned. But well, yeah. David, do you have anything, uh, issues or concerns with the motion? No, I think I've indicated within my comments there that with the provincial uh, COVID money, um, definitely we can offset that revenue loss um, as far as our expenses are concerned. The I understand through Tricia that they've already undertaken to remove the ice, so we're saving some uh, costs, direct costs there. And again, all in all, it's a wash from the city and it helps that group. So hopefully they're back and curling um, next September. Okay. All those in favor of the Hang on, hang on. Councillor Santor. Sorry, I, just, I don't know if this is an issue, but I, I don't want this decision to be put in jeopardy because of a perceived conflict. And Councillor Jones is a member of the Trail Curling Association. And I don't know if that matters if she, you're not anymore. 
No, you're not anymore. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure that if you were, that wasn't going to be a conflict. So I was going to say that I'd second the motion for you. <laughs> Thank you. But I do have a comment. Go ahead. I um, I just want to say I'm so glad that we're doing this because the curling club has worked so hard to get more members and to keep that, you know, the club going and to see this happen. It's almost like Keith said, you know, if we close it down for a year, we're going to lose curlers. We're going to lose members. And this is going to be next year will be a tough year for these guys, because don't forget, everybody will be almost two years older from the start of COVID and to get people back on the ice after that. If we're not bringing in younger players, this is gonna be a really hard um, club to get going again. So I just wanna you know, thank council for moving this forward and accepting this uh, proposal. Thank you, Colby. Recommendation, yeah. thank you. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Oh, sorry. Is your dog opposed? <laughs> the motion is carried. Okay, next moving into general government finance item 4.1, the self-isolation, self-quarantine. Uh, well, Councillor Centauri, you missed 3.1. Missed wind storm. What? You missed. You missed 3.1 windstorm. Yeah, windstorm. Oh, God. Oh, it's on the top of the page. 3.1 windstorm. Yeah, so I asked staff to prepare this report just to give uh, council a bit of an overview with respect to the significant uh, damages that the city experienced through the windstorm on January 13th. Um, obviously, Butler Park was one of the main um, areas that was hit. And I did put in my comment section that we are insured. And my initial understanding, given the sort of um, occurrence uh, was that we were limited to $25,000. However, uh, the $25,000 limitation was just for uh, the tree removal and tree replacement. So we are yeah. fully insured for the other uh, perils there. So I did send council an email explaining that. So in that regard, um, we are effectively covered. Uh, we have, I have exchanged an email with Mr. Maniego with respect to any losses that the uh, Baseball Association may have suffered. So we'll look to ensure that they're reimbursed for any costs that, that they may experience. Uh, but all in all, I think that, you know, the response of the city, notwithstanding Butler, just throughout the city was, was strong. We, per, we were grateful that the uh, Regional Fire Service participated and, and we were able to sort of make the areas safe and get them cleaned up um, quite effectively. So a uh, huge storm, hopefully you don't see that again. But um, when we were out that morning and the wind was still blowing, especially in Butler, it was a, a bit of a scary situation. So again, you know, just this is, report is just for information and the recommendation is that it be received and filed. Too bad it didn't blow, it's too bad it didn't blow down all the lamp posts and the insurance would have put up new lighting. Yeah, new exactly. <laughs> maybe maybe the old bridge. Move <laughs> acceptance. Uh, motion received, we have a seconder. I will, Eleanor. Eleanor. Oh, by the way, Dave, there was a lot of compliments in the community on how quickly, like yeah. the, for instance, at Gyro Park, you drove by it and then you come back, it was already cleaned up and gone. So it was noticed by a lot of people driving through. Yeah. So it's been moved and seconded to receive. All those in favor? Aye. Sandy, I had a question. Sorry, Sandy, I just had one question um, for uh, Mr. Perhudoff. Now there's a lot of trees have come down in Gyro and I usually get a few phone calls from people that are tree lovers down there. Is there a plan to, to replant? I, I haven't had a direct discussion with uh, Public Works, but definitely they'll go through and they have a professional um, arborist who will assess the trees and then they'll sort of make a plan in terms of a replacement. I think there actually is a longstanding policy like for every tree that comes down, we replace it with one or two. So um, hopefully that'll be done. We just have to be very um, cautious and selective in terms of the species and, and how we're planting because I think we are seeing the implications of some of these bigger trees and the fact that they don't have necessarily the strength in the root base and, and the issues it can cause with uh, large wind. So um, that'll be assessed and I will follow up with staff just to make sure that we're going to have a plan in place as far as replacements concerned. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Moving on now to uh, the health uh, self-isolation, self-quarantine policy, David. Yeah, I'll defer to Trisha. I think she was heavily involved in this and is also a member of the safety committee. So Trisha, if you don't mind taking this. Yeah, no problem, thank you. Um, so the goal of this was to develop a policy that would help guide um, sick leave usage in light of COVID-19. I think the recommendation is pretty straightforward in that it um, allows for some movement. So say if there's new information within that we learn about COVID and new and changes to it being from a two week quarantine to a three week or a five day quarantine that we can adjust as needed. But the idea is, is that um, we have this um, policy that would act as a guiding document to direct employees on the process through which we would manage um, illness uh, during a public health pandemic. So the idea is that this doesn't stay forever. It's purely during this, this pandemic or a, another health emergency, heaven forbid we have such a thing. Um, and that to ensure that it aligns with the most current public health um, officer directives and or relevant work safe um, regulations. So the, the document gives you a bit more detail. It was addressed mm -hmm. through the um, Occupational Health and Safety Committee and Sarah Benson and I co-authored this um, in the background through Brian Maloney. And so it has been vetted with the um, full OHS committee, which involves management and workers uh, within the work site. So everybody is well informed as to how this would be, um, I guess, applied. And they, I guess the other important piece for everyone is it has been tested. So there was an original draft of this document back in the day when COVID first hit that we then revised as we had to test the policy as COVID exposures or concerns um, surfaced through the workplace. And so we're now confident that this um, uh, res uh, represents well um, what we would expect to help make sure, uh, uh, help ensure the safety of staff and um, the rest of the workforce in any given work site. Any questions regarding the- I have policy? a question. I have a question. Eleanor? Yeah. Trish, was there was there an issue? Uh, did we have did we have an issue with this? Is that why this came up? No, not specifically. There has are you thinking about a COVID specific exposure yeah. concern? Yeah, yeah. No, but we have certainly had um, staff throughout the workforce that have had to be tested for COVID-19, because as you know, if you have any symptoms, that's usually the direction pro provided by the um, health advisors that you speak to. And so it does, this a policy would then apply. So if someone is being tested, how do we manage their time off work? Um, and, or if, you know, heaven forbid they were to test positive, how we would continue to manage their time off work and kind of gives a different level of authority of use of sick leave in ways that you wouldn't, I guess, traditionally see maybe if it wasn't in a health pandemic situation. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? I have no. a question. Go ahead. Lisa? Okay. Trisha, so I just noticed when I was reading this between the two bullets on page 22 of 41 and 23 of 41, the difference between the two categories seems to be the usage of bank time, where um, bank time is not allowed in the second portion, I believe, but it is in the first. Do you know why that was differentiated there? So let me find where you're looking at, Mayor Payson. So, sorry, what page did you say you were on? 22? Oh, 22 out of 41. So the first, the first, um, <clears throat> we'll see. So uh, under self-isolation, self-quarantine, it's got a paragraph and then it's got a bullet. And if you go to the usage, it says, and shall be entitled to use of sick leave, vacation time, bank time, or short-term disability benefits as may be determined by the benefits provider. And then the next bullet down, it's exactly the same, but it doesn't say bank time. And I just, I didn't really understand what the differentiating factor was um, between the two. Uh, good question. I don't recall there being a specific explanation. I could look at that more closely for you um, offline and get back to you if there was something unique, but I don't recall that. The idea was that we were doing what we could to support workers needing to be off and that they could utilize these different um, banks, for lack of a better word, that they would have. Right. Um, nothing's coming specifically to mind and just not to delay the meeting any further, I won't 
keep thinking, but I'll get back to you. So I just got a, a part two, and maybe this is covered off in different policy. Um, do we have a policy that clearly outlines if an employee um, chooses to travel during a travel advisory, say internationally, and then comes home and there's a quarantine required, what usage of sick time, bank time, vacation time, no time is, uh, is permitted? Uh, David can step in here too and correct me if I'm wrong, but this was dealt with way back in the early days of COVID. And it, so there was a bit of a leeway when, of course, when COVID hit, it was right in the smack dab start of spring break that there was a recognition that some employees may be away and were coming home. So they were kind of tr treated in a exempt fashion, but then the message was given to the entire workforce to say from a given point forward um, that if you chose to travel in light of the COVID restrictions that you were on your own when you came back, um, if you had to then quarantine for a period of time, um, meaning you've made a choice outside of the health recommendations. Okay. And David, if I've missed something important there, feel free to add in. Sandy. Yeah, go ahead, Robert. If you're waiting for a response there, we should defer this till the next meeting to give uh, Trish time to give uh, Lisa information because otherwise you pass it and then you may have to change it. So I'll move to defer. Do we need to defer is, well, Lisa, if, there, if a question is there, what Lisa asked the question, definitely you need to defer it as far as I can see. Otherwise you're gonna pass it and have to re look at it again. It doesn't make any difference, but that's that's the way I would look at it. Okay, so you're, I, you're, you're, talk, you're talking about one um, specific sort of word being missed or may not have been missed. So in the context of the approval, I'd suggest if bank time should be there, that it would just be added as an administrative correction and it doesn't require council to re-debate re or, or review the policy a second time. And if that's the case, we'll just advise all of council that we're making that amendment one way or the other. So we'll just get back to all of you once uh, Trisha's done her research. That's okay. right. I'm gonna ask Lisa, is it paramount for you to have that answer before you would undertake a motion? No, no, absolutely not. Okay, so I just, Sandy, I just have a quick question. Go ahead. Um, I know that this is a uh, city council policy that we're putting forward. I'm just wondering if it has been passed um, through the union or if the unions had a look at it. And, you know, because there was at the beginning of COVID when they were trying to bring in an agreement that we just sort of, you know, passed along and didn't do anything with. And I'm just wondering if any of the unionized employees have had a chance to look at this. David, I'm not. I'm... David? I can speak to that, um, Sandy yeah. and um, Colleen. The, so in the OHS committee, it is made up of um, a shared representation between management and unionized workforce. And the entire committee has vetted this um, policy. So yes, I would argue that the union has is well aware um, okay. of the policy and, and how it would be applied. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Michelle, I can't remember if we moved this yet or not. No. Okay, so we need a motion to proceed with the policy and for staff to amend it if necessary, amend the wording if necessary, administrative amendment if necessary. So I have a mover. So move. Eleanor, do we have a seconder? I can second. Paul, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Okay, moving right along, the next item is item 4.2, income tax issues regarding COVID-19. This has been brought forward, I believe it was uh, Robert's request seeking information. Uh, I don't think we need any discussion around it. Does this answer your question as far as uh, what you were looking for, Robert? Well, I'd like to make a couple of statements here, first of all. Sure, First ahead. of all, I want you to be clear, clear that I was right and that the, the opinion last year was wrong about this. Secondly, um, it, the issue is going to be the way David fills it in because the way he filled it in last year. Okay, when can I, I just stop you for a second? Robert, can I just stop you for a sec? No, hang oh, on no, a second. No. 
Okay. Oh, no, you hang on. I got this on. Well, the no, way I'm David told last well, year. I, Robert, I'm chairing the meeting and I'm asking if I could just stop for a second. Okay, go ahead. Okay. This is an administrative tax issue. There is no public, there is no public good. It's not a public issue. And it's either a tax issue or an administrative issue and should not be debated in a public forum. This has nothing to do with the general public. It's a taxation issue. It's not a, it's not a taxpayer issue. Well, I don't care There's if it's no public issue interest in, in this, Robert. I have an interest in it and I it's should be allowed to speak. So if you, if you want to yeah, overrule ahead, it, Robert, you got the, do whatever you do. Anyways, anyways, I was right. And David was wrong. Oh, good for you. And, uh, the way he filled in the last year, that was the point of contention, just so that you understand, all of you. He filled it in so that it was absolutely worthless to have him fill it in the way he did. He filled it in the way he did because he believed he himself to be filling it in responsibly, and I appreciate that, but he filled it in wrong. So I want you to know that I'm going to be asking for a T4 for this year and for 2019 because I kept all the documents from 2019, and I can go back. I've already cleared a Canada Revenue Agency. I can go back and reclaim those items in 2019. We work more than 50% from home, even without even without the um, Zoom meetings. Most of the work we do from home is actually it, it is done from home. I've ta I've timed the meetings that we take compared to what we actually do in terms of preparation for the meetings. So. I, I do think that it was really unfortunate that after I asked for it and uh, the decision was changed, we never really got a statement from Mr. Perhulov that in fact that I was correct. It always assumed that I was wrong. Mayor Santori, may I interject? Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I do. Don't like I, the I, I, do, I don't want to debate in public, but now um, this yeah. councillor has chosen to uh, suggest that I was wrong. There's a big difference between the T2200A, which he requested last year, and the new uh, COVID regulations. So with respect to the T2200A, which was filled out, it was vetted by a, a public accounting firm, it's filled out correctly. And if I was asked to fill out this T2200A again, I would do it exactly the same way. So again, I guess that's subject to debate. I'm not too sure uh, what Councillor Cachoni's qualifications are with respect to uh, tax law, but uh, again, we did ask tax experts who vetted the T2200A that he was provided. Um, with respect to the new um, request that was made, the T2200S is a different form. It is not the same as the form last year. And I've given council information that I was requested to get um, with respect to that. So um, it's up to council to determine how you choose to proceed. I don't know, I can't comment on how much time you spend at home working and what expenses you're incurring, but it's my duty, I guess, to follow the Income Tax Act and I'm not an income tax expert. So I did defer to um, the people who are and they did again, verify that the T2200A that um, this council was provided was filled in correctly. So um, again, wrong or right, I just take great offense to um, that comment and, and how it was positioned because it was researched and, um, I guess I, I, I don't know what else to say, but again, I just don't think that those comments were appropriate. Okay, um, thanks, David. And uh, as chair, I'm gonna suspend any further discussion. You've got the opinion. Robert, you can do a claim, get your forms, do whatever. Uh, case is closed on this topic. It's of no public interest whatsoever. Thank you. Okay, next item is 4.3 and it's the annual council stipend adjustment and how does council want to proceed under normal circumstances, we would take the same increase as the uh, QP, which I believe was 2%. How does council want to proceed in 2021? How we, will we proceed exactly as we did previously with the 2%? Okay, thanks, Robert. Do we have a seconder? Second. Seconded by Carol. Any discussion? Questions? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay, the motion is carried. Uh, can we mark me down, Michelle, as opposed? I'm sorry? Just mark me down as opposed. Thanks, Sandy. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Um, Paul. Grants in need. First, we need a, a motion to uh, receive the, rep uh, the report on grants as distributed. 
Do we have a motion to receive the re uh, grants report? Moved. Moved by Carol. Do we have a seconder? Seconded. Colleen? Yep. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the motion is carried. Next is um, the Selkirk College application for cash and uh, uh, yeah, based on the um, following the presentation that was made to Council today for in-kind services and a cash contribution of $7,500 for one year and $2,500 in-kind for the next three years totaling 7,500 in kind. What are council's wishes? Can I speak to that? Um, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, you know what? I, I'm, I, first of all, I wanna apologize for being late. <laughs> I was at the chiropractor and he was running behind and I'm really disappointed that I missed this presentation because I, I think it's a very valuable service that they're providing. Um, I think it's something that we need because we've got three communities that are doing the same thing. We've got Castlegar, we've got Nelson, we've got Trail that all have the same issues with the homeless and um, street people. And we have, um, we don't really have a collaborative report or anybody reporting out about it. So I think this is a great um, avenue to follow. And I believe that um, uh, the work that they're doing is pretty amazing. It's made a difference in the downtown trail because I've been there when the street nurses have gone and spoken to the street people. And uh, they've really made um, a difference helping these individuals and guiding them and telling them where they need to go for help and support. Uh, so I'm if the uh, somebody wants to make the motion, I would second it. You can make the motion. <laughs> but I spoke to it. But you can still make it if you want. Yeah, okay, make the motion. <laughs> okay. yeah. It's been moved by Colleen. Do we have a seconder? And then we can discuss it further if you'd like. Do we have a seconder to the motion? Third wow. time. No seconder to the motion? Well, you could second it, Sandy. I could, I'll, I'll second it for discussion, but now there's an opportunity to, for council to speak either for it or against it, Robert? Well, I wouldn't, I can't support it first of all until I find out what Nelson and Castlegar are doing and the other agencies from outside, because you can see one of them has already referred it to the um, community initiatives. That, that's what she said anyways. And the other one they're pending, waiting for, for, a, for a response. So, you know, I think it's, I just don't think it's a good idea to go with through of it now. I mean, I guess the other thing is, is it really, I think you suggested it, Sandy, that it's not really a, a business of, of council. I mean, you're looking at $15,000, you're looking at $15,000 and, that, and that's an issue. So I don't know. I mean, not that I not that I don't believe they do do a good job, and I've I've heard that they do a good job, but that, but that's not the issue as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Pauline, you had your hand up again. I did. Thank you, um, Sandy. I guess when I'm looking at the um, directive for the community task force, I would think that this would fall under some of that. I don't know if there's any area from the community task force budget to help support this. But um, I'm just going to throw that out there. I think we have room to do this. I think it's a valuable uh, resource that we can use in the, in the future when we're looking at homelessness and how to deal with the vulnerable uh, um, people in our, in our area. Are there any other comments? Councillor Santori. Um, so I think the first thing they needed with this grant was a letter of support. Oh, they said that was preeminent. So I'm not sure if we need to make a, a motion for a letter of support, um, but we can do that after we finish the, the next. Um, you know, when I was thinking about this over, over the weekend, I was thinking that, you know, $7,500 is 
a lot of money for a granting program. There's not a, a lot of organizations that get 7,500. Um, I'm, I'm glad that it was a one-time ask for 7,500. And I was thinking if we did motion this, it would be contingent, potentially making it contingent on Nelson or Castlegar um, also providing assistance. If we're, if we're really concerned about the collaboration and, and you know, them putting forward a, a grant application that is going to hit every single regional district because this is and region and municipality because this is a regional issue. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it would be appropriate to uh, refer them to the CBT CIP program with that, I mean, I, I don't sit, I don't adjudicate that program because of um, an application that I put in through the foundation. So it ultimately isn't my decision, but if you if you defer them to the program, you would, you know, you would probably have some kind of um, assurance that you would be providing them some money and you would be giving them a, a fair shot at having an approach of a regional reach with this. Um, so those are my thoughts on that. You know, I don't know if if you want to just commit to a regional or sorry, um, deferring them off or or trying for the seventy five hundred or approving that. Um, but it's uh, yeah. So that just my thoughts on that. There's a couple couple ways we can go about this. Anybody else? I guess my question is, well, um, and we all appreciate the work that the nurses program does, but. This grant has absolutely nothing to do with the on the street service that the nurses program currently offers. This is to provide some research around rural homelessness and and health issues uh, around our vulnerable population. <laughs> well, my biggest concern about these and researches and studies is that at the end of the day, that's what they end up being because the resources that are required to respond to the challenges that we have, as I indicated earlier, fall in with higher levels of government. I mean, this research can come back and say, well, we need housing, we need mental illness workers, we need drug addiction, we need people on the streets. Yes, we do. We, we can't carry those items out. We don't have anywhere near the resources. Our entire city budget wouldn't even come close to doing that. Go ahead, Lisa. Go ahead. Yep, I just had to take myself off mute. I, I, I can appreciate that, but I don't think that's what they're asking us to do. They are asking us to fund, provide funding for an assignment so they can work for solutions. They're not asking us to fund all the solutions and that's not the expectation. I mean, we have, we have a commitment, I think, and an interest as a city to deal with this homeless population and our, our vulnerable population. And this, this could be one piece in the puzzle as, you know, to get to some solutions. This is not a problem that's going to go away. We've got the street nurses that are on the ground doing work, actively engaged with this population. We all know that resources are slim. We all know that time is slim. Um, uh, I would like to support this in some way, um, or, you know, whatever that looks like through a deferral to the CBT for the rest of council to be making that decision or, or be making a cash grant on that. Okay. Andy? Well, go ahead, Robert. But the, the problem is that there's two, two asks. There's this ask for 7,500, and then there's another ask, which is actually people on the street for $2,500 a year for three years. That's my understanding. Is that is that what I understand to be right? Is that what I understand they're asking? Yeah. No, 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 they're asking for City of Trail staff to be able to provide some admin resources for, I guess, knowledge transfer that they need with the City of Trail. So I guess with that, my next question would be with city staff, do you feel that that in-kind support is something that we can manage? hard might be hard to ask because we don't um we don't know exactly what the need is i think they said five days in a year or something i'm not mistaken at five hundred dollars a day i think some clarity would be required around what sort of staff support they're looking for and we didn't learn that from today's presentation um, but what they did say is that the letter of support um, that is required by 
the end of week is not necessarily contingent on um, funding support, either cash grant or in kind. Um, I think the we as a municipality might be quite challenged in providing the in kind support, um, just knowing our staffing structure and presuming what some of the assistance um, they'll be looking for in terms of perhaps planning or mapping um, engineering. So um, uh, the the application as submitted is indicating the 7,500. I think that the in-kind support um, could be further fleshed out uh, with the organizers, depending on their success in, in achieving the matching funds. Okay. So if there's no other comments or discussion, we do have a I motion. Go a ahead. Question. Go ahead. Why can't they go? Why can't they go to the East End Services and then they get they they get everybody there? The regional district doesn't have a function that would be able to fund it. It would be an intermunicipal agreement for us to do, right, Robert? If we were to yeah. choose is that, what is that what? Oh, okay. yeah, we don't have a service. We we do not have a service. We'd have to create a service in order to fund that. Similar. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So could we read what the motion is? The motion is that we do provide the $7,500 as requested in the application for grant. And that was made by Colleen and I believe I seconded it. So now we'll take a two, sorry, Lisa, go ahead. Um, I'm just wondering if I can make a, a motion. An yeah, can I make an, an amendment? amendment? Yep, so I'm gonna, uh, CAO Perhoda, please correct me if I'm wrong with what I'm doing here. So I would like to amend the motion to provide a letter of support for the grant application as required. I would like a, an amendment to um, get further information on the in-kind staff support that is required before we make a decision. And as a result, I would like to defer the decision on the $7,500 until we are able to secure more information on staff resources that are required, as well as what the municipality of Nelson chooses to do with this grant application. Second, and Castle Guard, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we heard from Castlegar. They're they're putting it to the Columbia Basin Trust oh, Community okay, Program. Yeah. Okay, but I think there's two separate motions. I think there needs to be an amendment on the original motion first, Michelle. Well, Chair Santori, I think as I've heard um, Mayor Pazin explain, I think she's really just looking to defer decision on the motion that was placed. So I think a tabling motion might be in order in order okay. to allow staff to um, seek some further clarity from the um, Selkirk College organizers and okay. come back to you. And, and by that time, further decision-making may have been made by the other municipalities. So you'd know what those decisions were. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, Mayor Pazin, I think if, um, if we were to table the motion that was advanced, um, and seek some further clarity, you may, uh, and come back to you with it, you might have the answers you would need to vote on the motion as presented. Okay. But we will proceed with the letter of support immediately though. That was part Is of your Friday deadline. They have to have it in by the end of this week. Correct. Yeah. I thought I heard you say, Lisa, that we-, we Yes, I'd like to make the letter, they need that imminently. So should, Ms. McIsaac, should that be a separate motion then? I would just think yes, so, okay. yes. Yeah, that's what I thought. So the first amendment is, the amendment to the motion is to, to um, defer. the original motion pending further information regarding in-kind and funding. Do we have a, and Robert seconded the, seconded the, the tabling motion. All those in, for, in favor of the tabling motion? Aye. Opposed. The motion is carried. Now, do I have to go back to the original motion that was made? No. No, nope, okay. now we're just setting that aside. We'll bring that back to you when we have okay. more information. So now Lisa's also made a motion that we provide a letter of support for their initiative as presented. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Seconded by Colleen. All those in favor of the letter of support? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? The motion is carried. That was easy. Councillor Santori, before no. we adjourn the meeting, I, I just want to take the floor if you don't mind. Sure. Go Ms. McIsaac, I just want to circle back to 4.2. For administrative purposes, do you need it on record with the income tax issue that we are receiving the correspondence from the city in Grant Thornton? No, I'm sorry, I didn't ask. Um, 
No, we don't. Um, we don't. We're okay to let it I'll lie. Just indicate in the uh, indicate in the minutes that the the recording was received by council, um, but there's no motion that followed. Okay. Okay. Um, I just want to say something as mayor to this group. Um, I am so colossally disappointed at that conversation that happened directed towards CAO Parahudoff during 4.2. We have a code of conduct and as council members, we do not harass and bully staff and speak to them like that. I am sitting here, I am shaking. I am so disappointed that at a public meeting, we are now gonna have to broadcast our staff being spoken to like that. That is so, it is such an old school, disgusting way of speaking to staff and that has to end. That is enough of this. And I am really, I just apologize to the public that they have to witness certain members of council hearing them just speaking to our staff like that. And how demoralizing for our staff to have to work in an environment where they are verbally harassed by council members. I don't care if we disagree on issues. Um, the approach matters, words matter. And it, it really like, it, it, it's just, it's awful. And I, I am just, I apologize on behalf of the city to CAO Parahudov. This is an issue that didn't need to ever come to the table. I'm glad it came to the table because what it does is it shelters the city with a, with a professional opinion from Grant Thornton on what their limitation is and how they um, need to interface with council when it comes to this issue of taxation. And I'm just gonna leave it at that. Well, um, you know, further to that though, your worship as the chair, it's my job to try to control the meeting. I attempted to control it. And there's, some, there's only so much a chair can do when somebody just chooses to talk over you and get their two bits worth in. And I'm just as upset as you are. And I hope the rest of the council members are. Colleen, you've worked with, and, and uh, Carol, you've all worked with other people. We have a reaction again. Well, this would have all been... This would have all been said. I'm speaking right now, so this is a time when you keep your mouth shut. Well, then you then, then you let me speak when you're finished. I'm going to order you guys. My I don't God. want to hear this again. I'm tired I'm of hearing this. Speak, getting Robert. lectured. Can I'm I tired of getting lectures minute. from people. Can I speak? Or Robert, I got the floor. Go ahead. Go we'll speak. I've got the floor. Go we'll speak. Oh. Go ahead. It's not worth it. Go ahead. Keep talking. People will really. Well, I'm not. I'm, I'm just saying that nobody. All we'd have to say is when I raised this issue before, I raised the issue before. I told you quite clearly in an email to yourself, Sandy, that this yeah. never needed to go to Grant Thornton. Could have went to Canada Revenue Agency. And Why Canada didn't you put Revenue that in your Revenue Agency? Canada Revenue Agency would have given you an opinion. Why wouldn't you do it? It's a ta it's a personal well, taxation issue. Because I've asked it, and he he, he filled it in. Order. The yeah. That's and awesome. a call for adjournment. Yeah, good. Colleen. Let's go. Thanks, Let's Colleen. Have a break. Thanks, Colleen. Okay, leave the meeting. We'll back, get back into close, and I hope this topic doesn't come up. Exactly. Oh.